Strong Pokemon, weak Pokemon. That is only the foolish perception of people. Truly skilled trainers should try to win with their favorites. This simple phrase uttered by Karen of the Elite Four perfectly encapsulates the themes of the Generation 2 games and the lessons learned by its main characters. It's also able to start a flame war on Twitter on a near monthly basis. Which in fairness isn't saying all that much. See, oftentimes people will use this line to criticize competitive Pokemon players who simply copy teams that are already proven to be strong instead of trying to come up with more unique strategies. Every time this image makes the rounds on Twitter, it quickly devolves into arguments about competitive metas and stale competitions and a sea of passive-aggressive retweets. Heck, someone's probably retweeting me right now. Now, I'll admit, I'm far from a competitive Pokemon player. I don't really know much about which Pokemon are popular and what overused strategies people are even complaining about. So, as an outsider with no stake in the game, I'm not here to give my opinion on the matter. I'm here to give you the answer. This is a full statistical analysis on the current competitive Pokemon scene. Richard, uh, hit that intro. As someone without a ton of first-hand experience with competitive Pokemon, my first thought when seeing this quote is, is it even true? Are certain Pokemon actually stronger than others? Do competitive players really only use strong Pokemon? And can you actually win with your favorites? These are the three main questions I want to try to answer today. But to do that, we're going to need some data. Now, normally, this is the part of the video where I'd make some joke about having to collect an obscene amount of data myself. I'd look over at Richard and incredulously state the ridiculously large number of competitive battles and teams I'd have to comb through and categorize. But thankfully, today, I don't have to record the teams and results for 1,677 battles? This is thanks to the good folks over at VGC Pastes, a community of competitive Pokemon players that records all sorts of data from official Pokemon tournaments. They do an amazing job of organizing loads of data into concise, publicly available spreadsheets. This video would not have been possible without them. Links to their Twitter and where you can support them in the description down below. For today's video, I specifically looked at the data they collected from last year's regional VGC tournaments from Orlando, Liverpool, San Diego, and the Oceania International Championships, since those were the most complete data sets available. Hey, Future Charlie here, just to clarify because I know I'm going to get some comments about this. Yes, the 2023 tournaments don't exactly reflect the current meta. They were contested under slightly different regulations than this year's VGC tournaments with different Pokemon available. As the current regulation is still actively ongoing, there isn't enough concrete data on the specific win rates of each Pokemon yet. So some of the specifics in this video in regards to which Pokemon are the most popular or the most successful might not exactly reflect the current VGC meta, but the overall trends and findings still apply. Alright, now back to the video. They give us all sorts of data, including the placement of the top 100 or so players and the six Pokemon on their teams, and how often each Pokemon appears across the whole tournament. We are interested in seeing if there truly is a relationship between how strong a Pokemon is and how often it's used. To do that, we're going to need to do a tiny bit of math. It's not that complicated, but to spice things up, I thought we'd play a little game. Leave a comment below with your guess of how many times I'll have to say the word percent or percentage in this video. If you're right, there's a prize waiting for you at the end of the video. Spoilers, it's way more than you think. 
Oh, and don't be editing your comments at the end or anything, all right? We can all tell you're not that slick. All right, first, to see how often each Pokemon is used, we can divide the total number of teams that featured each Pokemon by the total number of teams in each tournament to get a percentage of how often they're used. Doing this, we see that there are a handful of Pokemon that show up way more often than others. For example, Iron Hands features in just under 30% of teams across all four tournaments. Golden Go features in 31%, but the most common Pokemon was Amoongus, finding a place on 37% of all teams, more than one in every three. These are the 10 most commonly used Pokemon across the four tournaments in question. This shows us that competitive players do tend to favor certain Pokemon more than others. But that's only half the question answered. We still need to find out if they're choosing these Pokemon because they're strong, or if everyone in VGC is just a huge Amoongus stan. To do that, I looked at how often each Pokemon featured in a team that placed within the top 15% of a tournament. If we then divide that by the total number of teams in the top 15% of a tournament, we can find the percentage of how often each Pokemon ranked near the top of the leaderboard. If the Karen quoters are right, and a truly skilled trainer can win with any Pokemon regardless of its strength, then a Pokemon should appear within the top 15% of teams just as often as it would appear in the whole tournament. If half the teams had a Pikachu, and the strength of Pikachu didn't matter at all, then half the teams in the top 15% should have a Pikachu on them. If certain Pokemon are truly stronger than others though, then they will naturally be concentrated towards the top of the rankings and will therefore have a higher proportion in the top 15%. To quantify this, we can subtract the actual percentage in the top 15% for each Pokemon by its expected percentage, aka its percentage for the whole tournament, and get what is called the deviation. A high deviation means that a Pokemon tends to perform better than average, and a negative deviation means that it performs worse. If you zoned out after the fourth or fifth time I said percentage, don't worry, there's really only two things you need to care about from here on out. We have one percentage that measures how often a Pokemon is used in a competitive tournament, and a deviation which measures how well it performs. And with those two simple factors, we can finally answer the burning question on all your minds. Do competitive players really only use strong Pokemon? The best way to visualize this is with a scatter plot, comparing the Pokemon's usage to its deviation. If Karen is right, and there is no relationship between how often a Pokemon is used and how well it performs, then the plot will look totally random. If the people on Twitter are right, and competitive players only use strong Pokemon, then the plot will look more like a line with a clear relationship. And so, I compiled all the data from all four tournaments into one final data set, did all the calculations, plotted all the points, and finally found the answer. Will we see a clear relationship, damning proof that competitive Pokemon players are unoriginal copycats who only use the proven winners, or a true random array, showing that VGC players have been winning with their favorites all along. Folks, let's see that data, and it's sort of both. I mean, the first half of the plot looks well and truly random, with an even distribution of Pokemon above and below the average, regardless of how often they were used. But looking at the second half, we see a very clear positive relationship with nearly every Pokemon ranking above average. So what does this mean? Well, for starters, the high end of the plot clearly shows that the most common Pokemon do tend to perform disproportionately well in tournaments. Of the top 10 most common Pokemon, 
eight have a positive deviation. This shows that overused Pokemon like Amoongus, Golden Go, and Iron Bundle truly are better in a competitive sense than other Pokemon. But what about that first half? What's going on there? Well, I can think of two possible explanations for the more random distribution. It could simply be that the sample size is too small. When a Pokemon only shows up a handful of times in a tournament, it's more prone to being affected by outliers, like someone absolutely going off with an arguably weaker Pokemon, or people dropping the ball with a Pokemon that has a lot of potential. When the sample size is small, the skill of each individual player matters a lot more. There is one other potential reason for this peculiar shape, though. A reason that nobody seems to be talking about, and a reason that could finally end this debate for good. It's a little complicated, but I'll do my best to explain it as succinctly as possible. People do try to win with their favorites. The topic of a competitive metagame and the emergence of popular strategies can be complicated, but I think the shape of this graph perfectly highlights how it works. In the beginning, we have this sort of soup, where everyone's trying out different Pokemon and teams to find out what works and what doesn't. As players discover which Pokemon and strategies work more consistently than others, a few dominant meta threats rise above the rest. But it's important to remember, a Pokemon that's used the most often isn't necessarily the best Pokemon. It's just the one that people have realized is good. As an example, Gothitelle was only used by 5% of players, yet it placed in the top 15% over 10% of the time, more than twice as often as we would expect, showing that it is quite strong, it's simply not being used as often. Also, real sorry for everyone who guessed 18 in the percent poll from earlier and thought we were done, that's rough buddy. And for everyone who guessed 22 and is feeling pretty stoked right now, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. Pulling that thread a bit more, the Pokemon with the highest deviation is Dondozo, who is relatively popular, being the 11th most commonly used Pokemon. It features on 14% of teams, and yet it places in the top 15% 23.5% of the time. In second place was Golden Go, which also happens to be the second most popular Pokemon. Despite being used way too often, it's somehow not used as much as it should. On the other hand, the Pokemon with the lowest deviation was Gastrodon, which placed in the top 15% less than half as often as it should. Look folks, I know you like your bulky slug, but you gotta stop trying to make Gastrodon happen. Meowskarata and Roaring Moon are the only two Pokemon in the top 10 of usage with a negative deviation, which could mean they're not as good as people think or that they have a higher skill cap. A lot of people use them, but not everyone knows how to use them. Okay, that's cool, but what does it all mean? Who was right? Well, I think this graph shows that competitive Pokemon players are not a monolith. With these tournaments, there were plenty of players that stuck to the dominant threats, but there were just as many that tried to experiment with the less tested, potentially weaker Pokemon. But based on the data, we can definitively answer the questions from the top of the video. Yes, there are Pokemon that are categorically stronger than others. There's no perception going on here, Karen. However, it's also true that competitive players generally do tend to only use the same few strong Pokemon rather than experimenting with their favorites. So, ha! There you have it, competitive Pokemon players. You're all unoriginal, lazy copycats, and the Karen quoters on Twitter were absolutely, categorically, 100% wrong. Yes, it's true, we have proven that people only like to use strong Pokemon. But I think the question a lot of people forget to ask is, why shouldn't they? This is a competition where the goal is to try to win. Why wouldn't you use the Pokemon that consistently win? 
Within the fiction of the Pokemon world, having a strong bond with your partner Pokemon and bringing out their full potential, understanding the power that's inside, is crucial to being a truly great trainer. But in reality, Pokemon is not that type of game. It's a game of numbers. It's one big complicated math equation. Whether you love your Pokemon or grinded them out of an egg yesterday, it doesn't actually make any difference. Uh, heck, even happiness is just another variable in the equation. Sure, you can try to win with your favorite Pokemon, plenty of people do, but the operative word there is try. In reality, certain Pokemon are simply better than others. It's easy to imagine going into a tournament with your team of underpowered favorites and outthinking your opponents to win, but I think people forget that in a competitive tournament, all the trainers are truly skilled, and if their team is significantly better than yours, you're just gonna lose every time. Look, I get that it can be annoying seeing an Amoongus every other battle. I mean, I played Marvel Snap during the Loki Collector days. I know a thing or two about oversaturated metagames. If you got that reference, I feel your pain. But I don't think that a more limited meta necessarily correlates to a less interesting game. If both players are working with these same tools, then the only thing that matters is the skill and game knowledge of both players. It's like telling an Olympic sprinter that they should try to win with their favorite pair of flip-flops. So, what's the lesson? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Use whatever Pokemon you want. If you want to go in with your ragtag group of favorites, you can do that. If you want to equip yourself with the best team out there to truly test your skills against the best of the best, you can do that too. And if you want to try to cook up some crazy new strategy and find the next broken mon for people to complain about on Twitter, then by all means, my friend, cook away. Oh, and for those who left their guess on our little bet earlier, the correct answer was 27. If you managed to guess 27 spot on, then congratulations, you win percent. Ha ha, you win nothing. You were wrong, you fool. Ha 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 ha, you've fallen right into my trap. I know that you just scrolled to the end of the video to see the winning number and you left your guess and then you liked your own comment thinking none of us would notice, but we did. I see right through your little games, my friend. All right, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready on the chip thighed show. Ha. <laughs> oh, and uh, if you guess 28, you win, uh, I don't know, like a, like a high five or something? Here, put her there. There you go. I hope it was worth it. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alkazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer94, and Captain Kirby. This show would not be possible without your support, so thank you.